what was it? Oh god, again another bloody phone call. Hello and welcome to Cairncast. This is episode ten, and we are here to talk about another interesting topic. We hope, yeah, about uh, specialty coffee, especially here in the UK, and business. Um, with quite often a slant of marketing and how we market our own business here at Cairngorm Coffee. Um, here with Harris, are we going to do the same as last time? How was your week? How was your weekend? Uh, good. I'm trying to even think. You're summing it up. Oh, I was. No, but that was last week. I was in Glencoe the end of last week, and then over the weekend I didn't do very much. I think both you and I have fairly uninteresting lives. I don't I agree. Don't want to speak for both of us. <laughs> like, yeah, like I'm not even going to ask how your weekend was. I don't care. Um, well, I was. Oh, if you, yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, <laughs> I was at the UKBCs on Friday. So oh yeah, of cool. course. Yeah, that was really cool. Um, supporting Kyle, who did really well, and. Um, I think the biggest takeaway for uh, him and I and, and our team is certainly just um, the the quality on show at these events is unbelievable, right. and we've learned a lot from it. And I think we'll come back stronger. So it's going to be yeah, it's going to be cool to maybe look forward to to next year and hopefully try and bring some more people along from our team for the ride. Because you know, Grumpy Mule as, as an example had three people competing in the finals so i don't know how many entered but there's no cap i don't think are you because they sponsored it are you saying that's how they got the three people well, so in? is that what you're saying no so um <laughs> it's basically like first come first serve so you have to be it? super quick so i don't know whether they got like you know they <laughs> got a leg up <laughs> we're know, not insinuating pre-sale or something but <laughs> no i yeah. i think uh i don't know i think you can just you can enter as many people as you want which i good. think Awesome experience for both you and Kyle. I, I agree. I think you guys will come back stronger. It's incredible to think how well he did, considering it was first time competing, how little time he's been a barista. So we're massively proud, I would say, of him. And yeah, you're saying for you, you're putting a lot of work into that. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's good, I think, to see fruits of that. And like you're saying, to be, it's quite a niche specialty coffee environment when you're down there so to meet the people chat to people like you met a few interesting people last week didn't you definitely um yeah, yeah no, no, like just good to catch up with people more than anything then there's very few occasions in the diary from a coffee perspective especially if you live in scotland mm. um to be able to come across the, the kind of superstars in england uh, likes of ryan garrick who i know from when he worked up here in glasgow um who's now head of coffee or director of coffee head of coffee at watch house um so like even just have a quick chin whack with him and catch up is yeah it's uh it's something that we should try and do more often probably and i guess the next one on the calendar will be london coffee festival uh so which is know. very soon yeah. um i yeah i think that's also i think it's partly fueled the reason for the topic you would like to discuss today i guess as well is meeting some of these people and seeing some of the different businesses that are across the speciality coffee industry. Yeah, I think it's probably mainly taking from that, like how intense and I don't want to say nausea, but like it was a pretty, you know, um, yeah, pretty intense environment in terms of the coffee that was served, as we've said before, is not widely uh, considered to be the coffee that you would come across um in, in everyday life or you know you wouldn't wake up on a sunday morning and make a rwandan sidra or a colombian geisha some people maybe would they can comment on the on the video and let us know but um something I, I wrote down not long after that on my phone if you'll uh humor me while i read it because it is i think quite like an insightful um commentary into where i'm at and where i'm thinking in terms of uh ourselves within the coffee industry so i wrote down uh my job isn't to buy the best coffee and serve the best coffee that money can buy my job is to find a way to market the most profitable and therefore financially sustainable coffee business that i can so the issue with that statement is it does sound quite uh capitalism driven yeah <laughs> um but I think what I'm trying to say is um, there's intentionality around the decisions we're making when we're sourcing coffee. <coughs> we're not, you know, we are privy to some of the best coffees in the world. Yeah. Um, and we can get our hands on them. Um, but we think more about a kind of ecosystem that allows us to be 
yeah, sustainable as a business. Um, and all the kind of knock-on effects of that in terms of looking after staff, being able to buy coffee from farmers who um, who deserve to be paid even if they're not de- or can't afford to develop the most expensive lots and stuff. Um, and yeah, it's just an interesting one. I, I do think it's more challenging to market uh, coffee, which isn't as highly desirable um, as it is the kind of more run-of-the-mill. Yeah. So have I gone off on a magic, massive tangent? No, I, I, sense? Yeah, it does make sense. I think um, we, we've chatted about this, I think, multiple times because it is across a lot of topics, really, that obviously you run Cairn Gorham to make money. Like, without being able to make money, there's not a business. And um, that operating model of selling really high-end special coffees, we were kind of chatting about this off-air, what is the market for people paying five pounds for their flat white? Because that's maybe what you'd have to charge it at to make money if you sold only geishas or sidras in as your your coffee in your cafe. So it's, I think, treading that line between what do customers want and what is available. But I think like you're saying, it's not that difficult to buy the best coffees, is it? It's not that difficult to go out and be like, show me the best. No, not uh, yeah, no, not really. I thought like f- people would argue that maybe, but yeah, you can buy competition lots like they are widely available. Mm-hmm. Um, it depends how far down the rabbit hole you want to go. There are guys who will have competed and you know who will have reached the finals that have probably put in a much more intensive sourcing program to be able to get the absolute best. Yeah. Um, do, do but, just quickly on that as a side note, do you think that's a slight lesson learned? Uh, for the barista championships again next year do you think the quality of the coffee obviously we used a very high quality geisha but do you think uh, that you know Kyle's routine was about accessibility to a certain extent were the winning coffees there the most expensive coffees do you know more about that annoyingly not like they're not. Quite, it's quite guarded not from a like I wasn't able to taste any of them yeah um, so I was only yeah, maybe we shouldn't. I can't even say this, but like we weren't even really allowed to try Kyle's coffees okay. that he created. Obviously, I could backstage, um, but there are certain um, ah to make sure to that rules. he has dialed it in right and he's created the right recipe. But like all that. even when he comes off the stage, like all those coffees get put on a trolley. Yeah, and you can't just go up and try them. They get taken backstage and they have to be put down the sink. I th- it's quite. Strange, because I guess then it's to stop a Q grade in your team coming in and then having a point oh. of our, of contention. Oh, I disagree. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which you know you can understand. Um, yeah, and it's very tightly the the, the judge um, structure is extremely tight. Like you, yeah, yeah. You can uh, at one point Alex, who is a past employee of ours, uh, took a few photos because he had like a pass to be able to do that. Um, but because there was a connection with Kyle, they came over to tell us that he could get disqualified if uh, if Alex talks to him. Like, when he's setting up on stage, but pre is starting. Which, again, it's like they, they can't have any risk of him being coached. Yeah. Like once he's on stage, he's it's over to him. And, yeah, it's quite... his mental. And I guess, like, all of this experience is something that, yeah, has just really solidified to me that, like, okay... These coffees, that's where they belong almost. Mm. <laughs> like, I understand why these coffees exist now. Yeah. And, like, what their, their purpose is. The question, I guess, is always, like, um, should these coffees or uh, will these coffees leak out more into public consciousness or whatever yeah. and be more widely available? I, I find that fascinating. Can I just quickly clarify as well, just, I guess, for viewers' own clarification, that when we talk about the coffees that we serve in our cafes generally they sit at probably around six pounds per kilo for us to buy to say 10 to 15 maybe max if we're really pushing the boat out but on the whole it's you know six to eight pounds probably maybe a little bit higher whereas these competition coffee type things how much per kilo are we talking for some of that stuff so so our the one that kyle competed with was Double your top end there, so six, uh, sixteen fifty, say yeah, a kilo. Um, but it's 
How fairly long common for them to be 40 plus to 100 pounds a kilo. I'd so they're imagine. five times, or yeah, okay, 10 um, times the cost of what the normal coffee you are drinking in a cafe will cost. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. And obviously we made a conscious decision to try and be realistic about, like I'd never roasted a geisha before, no yeah. one on our team had. Yeah. Um, which it's kind of mind blowing. And like, like, that's not a pat on my own back, but like, I, I was, uh, I was, uh, for like, I feel fortunate that we didn't completely mess it up, especially for Kyle. Like, you know, he put trust in us to, to not mess it up. So a lot of research went into like, how do we approach the first ever roast of a geisha we're doing because it's yeah. going to be to the scrutiny of eight judges. In hindsight, we need to film more of that stuff because I think that is the kind of content that, you know, super, super interesting. Imagine, you know, you've got Jack filming that first roast because I remember it, you're absolutely shite in your pants. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, we put in six kilos, I think it was six kilos, so yeah. what's that? Well, pretty much a hundred quid worth of coffee. Yeah. And if you don't do it right, it goes straight in the bin. Yeah. And the problem, like, uh, and there is a, a question here, um, uh, ethics question around the competition where like the average competitor will have multiple roasts done of a coffee that probably aren't absorbed into like they're not used for the competition you know to get it right yeah like so for us as an example i think we did four roasts yeah um, through the whole process which i think is quite on, on the low end mm. i would imagine uh, I don't have really have again like we're complete novices. Is novice mean you're a beginner? Yeah. Yeah. Novices at um at the, this coffee competition lark. Like we don't really know what's normal, yeah. but it <laughs> seems like that. Well, you guys did an all right job, I guess. But yeah. Yeah, I guess like we we try to be um yeah quite uh, sparing. I think with yeah. with the amount of uh, coffee we're using, but I would imagine a lot of these guys are roasting batches and having like kilos kicking about because and we can go on to this but like when you f for this purpose when you're roasting it it really devalues the coffee in a weird yeah. way it's like when you are doing five kilo roasts of a geisha and you know you're not going to be selling it it's literally for this purpose if it doesn't taste as good as you want you go on to the next roast yeah <laughs> and that coffee it just like f has a perceived lack of value weirdly because you know its purpose is to taste incredible for competition but if we had a coffee that we were serving in our shops that was 16 pound 50 a kilo we would be trying to absorb every gram of that coffee which we, we did do i think this is probably quite a good segue and you have behind you interestingly so this is kind of what robbie the crux of today's whole discussion is around um these super high-end coffees and you know robbie basically we, we found kyle's coffee and robbie right from the start was like, I want to sell that as well. I want to have the ability to either sell that in our cafes or sell it to our customers. Yep. Um, so almost it's kind of, we're, we're talking about what are the opportunities to sell these coffees and can you build a business really around selling these high-end coffees? But I guess for you, quite important to you is I'm going to buy this coffee and I don't want to waste it as well. Mm -hmm. Like I have to buy 50 odd kilos, whatever I bought. Yep. So the stuff I don't use for the competition we're going to sell. Yeah, definitely. And and it's funny, like we have these conversations and I feel like quite often we are negative about <laughs> like things that we're actively trying to promote, which is quite, it's, it's not the intention, but I think- We're very Scottish. We're, yeah, <laughs> the self-deprecating nature. But yeah. I think it's what we're trying to do is almost think outwardly and transparently to try and involve as many people in what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and part of that is like, yeah, we're talking about like, is there a market for these high-end coffees at the same time as we're trying to sell them or yeah. we're getting ready to market them? It's kind of, if it maybe seems a little bit, um, yeah, like it's probably not the most sensible approach in terms of marketing, but um, what's more valuable to me is to try and understand the industry, try and understand our business and try and understand like how these things fit in because I think it gives us a better opportunity then a better chance of being able to actually execute it well. A quick question on that then. Is there anyone businesses that you know whose sole focus is the super special end? Um, so yeah, basically their business is selling competition type coffees and that's it. Yeah, I should know an answer to that. But <laughs> So I'm engaged with um, 
other people's coffee now. Though. <laughs> I'm completely self-obsessed. Because uh, we, we've chatted about that before, that obviously, it, is it a standalone business? How easy would it be you know, to sell? Because a lot of the special coffees, when you see them being marketed, they're 100 grams usually, yeah, uh, round about that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so well, it's... The yeah. special guest is probably the one that comes to mind. Yeah, well. that's the one I was kind of thinking of. Um, which is exclusively small bags, isn't it? Yeah. And he was there. I was... He's... Who's he? Paul Ross. Yeah. Who, like, is one of the... I've had this... Superstar! Yeah, I've had this conversation with Harris before, and he's literally like, get in the bin. <laughs> Being like I once saw Colin Harmon and, like, crapped myself. Yeah. yeah. Two I do love two. that. It's obviously, it's me coming in. It's a different industry, but obviously, yeah. he is a superstar in the coffee industry. UK coffee industry. Yeah. Globally? Global superstar? Yeah, he's competed in competition a lot, I'd say. But, he, but he's, to me, more just, like... Like uh, you make up a super in, superstar is in your own head, almost. Yeah. So it's like for me, it's someone I respect. Is he's been through the ranks of like a lot of really good coffee, you know? Would you say iconic like UK coffee businesses like yeah. Casa Hippo and uh, where was he working most recently? I can't remember. But um, it's like if I was to see Warren Buffett or like a superstar accountant, I yeah. might be like, I oh, know, I wouldn't know he looks. There like. he is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. So yeah, I think like uh, he's an example. I just I don't know. Like he, so, he's he was competing this year, and I guess like the question is: is the reason he's competing because he's trying to market uh, that side of the business, and that is the perfect place for him to market yeah. the business because it's like these are the coffees that he would be selling on his website. Um, I think more regularly, it's like there's. If if that's up here, they're like in terms of coffees that you can buy that are, that they're selling. Yeah. Like and down here is like <laughs> guilty uh, pleasures. No way, <laughs> guilty pleasures around here. Oh right. <laughs> no, like more like I'm thinking like Starbucks kind like oh. the type you know commodity yeah, style commodity. coffee. Yeah. Then like there's a big cluster. It's quite busy up around just below that high end where there's yeah. like, you know, April, Tim Wendelboe, um, yeah. you know, all these guys that that have some really sensational coffees, but then, um, but maybe don't necessarily venture into the more kind of like house coffee stuff. Yeah. Having said that, April is a massive inspiration to me because Patrick Rolfe, the owner, has done some really interesting ways of how to like penetrate that, lower <laughs> the lower market yeah <laughs> um yeah and you know that's by like adding transparency and clarity around okay this coffee is for your milk espresso mm. um and we've been super sustainable by buying a, a whole snapshot of a, of a farm from a, of a farmer of Vulcan Azul in Costa Rica yeah so he'll buy like the super high lots and he'll buy the more run of the mill like mid 80s scoring i guess i don't really know low yeah. to mid um and that will form his sustainable profile which is like the kind of milk and i think that's something that inspires me massively i um, find that very interesting i'm trying to think of other industries again because we like to try and make this relevant i guess where there is people who operate only in the high end and yeah. uh, uh, you know fashion wise we talked about off air again your gucci's and all that kind of stuff like obviously they are solely cater yeah. for high end clothing it's i don't know if it's slightly different for coffee but obviously gucci are what, not going to start selling what four was it kinds like of george stuff. armani right yes had like what was the goey thing do you know the goi because i feel like no. there's maybe a couple of examples where there's like they've got their they've tried to dip their toe they've tried to go like more mainstream underneath it well i, find I guess that's the that's the kind of comparison I but we chat about this a lot do the fact that I don't know is like, are they trying to almost differentiate those brands? So probably the ultimate owner of Armani, are they like, we could do with dipping our toe into the lower end, yeah. but we don't want it to be associated with us at all. I think the most famous high-end brand in the world, which is now I think one of the most, if not the most highly val valued company in Europe, which is interesting given it's not a tech company, mm -hmm. is uh, LMVH. So... Uh, what does that mean? Lamar Zocco. <laughs> Louis. Moe. Yeah, whatever. It's like Moe, Hennessy. Hen what was what it? So it's a comp. LMVH. God, how can I not remember what this? Is it? They've all come together. Yeah, so like just a conglomerate. 
conglomerate of luxury brands, basically. And so they do come up with a better name. (laughs) I think it's it's a good. Can you shout out? Moe Hennessy, Louis Vuitton. But in French, for some reason, they've modelled up the letters. Um, so, I, obviously, in in the world, catering purely to the luxury market does seem to work. Um, and I guess the conversation we're having here is, is that possible in the coffee industry? And I guess your thoughts slightly are, or do you need to have more strings to your bow? Or do you need to cater to the masses? They're all, I think this is what we're talking about, off they're all different business models, really, aren't they? Yeah, and obviously, we've spoken before about focus, and I think, like, yeah. the wider your net becomes, the the less impactful you become in each of those areas. And I think that's yeah. where it's taken us six years of being a roasting business to roastigation because it's like mm. we've been quite laser focused on what we're trying to achieve with our market is that and do you think slightly driven by having cafes as well obviously you need to cater to your cafe customer yes i think so like i think it, it's it's easier to uh brand and market a really really high-end coffee brand yeah when there's no risk of someone coming in and the toilets are dirty or you know what i mean it's yeah like, it's or, very or interesting they get like a bad coffee or customer experience it's like you know you can really take control with a tight-knit amount of the workforce to be able to deliver your your kind of system in a 360 perspective i think that's a very interesting point yeah if i came in and like watch house for example like immaculate places that they have sometimes it's High end requires high cost a lot of the time up front, doesn't it? To put in the effort to make incredible spaces and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's a very interesting. But, but as an, an example of that is like they don't do wholesale, and I was trying to write about this, mm. and like that's one less variable where yeah. someone could misrepresent you yeah, almost, yeah. and that factors into the perceived quality of of what they're able to achieve. I guess that's a very interesting one as well, isn't it? Yeah, controlling your own brand and quality. Uh, and that is probably where that's probably my biggest flaw is obsessing over a brand and like yeah because uh, to a certain extent you have to let the brand basically breathe for itself it's like you can't you can't really grow and be like obsessing over every minor detail do you think you're also limited to a certain extent from a coffee perspective with the education of the coffee population in your neighborhood so for example, would a watch house, I don't know if they're opening in Edinburgh, would a watch house type of cafe work in Edinburgh? You've probably got some examples of very similar cafes, I guess, and yeah, the answer is yes. Because well, I think watch house, as, as an example, are, I, I don't know what their mission statement is, but it feels to me like their goal is to be really high quality, but still approachable. So, like, yeah. you come and you get a good experience. It doesn't matter if you're, like, Joe Bloggs, who has instant coffee at home or you're um you've competed in ukbc it's like yeah. they're trying to just deliver s- quality yeah um and i suppose that like it does feel like they have quite a laser focus on like what they're trying to do yeah. i don't like i've massively just probably butchered what their actual mission statement is but that's the, the impression i get is like they're trying to make like a place where it's kind of community like it feels like a nice place to go and yeah. just have great experiences um and I think like the that's quite a hard thing to action because when you're doing really high end coffee, um, it can f- it can transcend into being quite sterile. I feel like it's yeah, yeah. it's quite a, it's quite a challenging one. And I think you do open yourself up to more criticism from like a wider demographic, like um, as in people coming in and being like, "That's not what our coffee should taste like." Yeah, like. I mean, let's use Lowdown as an example, who are, like, one of my biggest, like, Scottish inspirations. Like, yeah. Paul is obviously an incredible barista slash businessman slash... He's developed this coffee... Um, concept. Almost. Concept slash yeah. brand uh, to become, you know, you arguably the, the pinnacle of coffee in Edinburgh. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, he bemoans quite a lot about having bad bad reviews but that's as a result of people maybe not understanding and buying into what he's trying to achieve yeah and i think it's like it's much it's much uh easier to get 
um, less bad reviews if you set the bar if you're like quite transparent about like the bar not being that high almost yeah. as soon as the bar gets raised and you're like we're the best at this then people have really high expectations and then it's harder to hit i think like in a cafe environment it's incredibly hard to to be perfect i i agree i think that's and i've noticed this since i've got more involved obviously in the coffee industry is that when you do go abroad because I'm I thinking more from a tourist point of view here, you uh, seek out, you Google and look at, obviously, TripAdvisor to find what are the best specialty coffee shops. And obviously, I know from an Edinburgh point of view, uh, Lowdown ranks very highly when it comes to those kind of ratings. So yeah. I think it is really a must. If you are a coffee person, it's probably one of the go-tos when you get to Edinburgh, if you are a tourist. And I think we... Cairn Gorm does well from that sense also but almost caters to a slightly different crowd and i guess that's what you could probably go on to say is that you have to, you have to cater to such a wide crowd you've got offices you've got mm-hmm. residents there is then quite a big tourist we've then got bonnie and wild which is a completely different market as well and then frederick street it's i guess does that play into all of your you need to figure out how to cater for all of those different people yeah and obviously with frederick street we put quite a lot of effort into trying to go further down that rabbit hole of, yeah. of um, meticulous approach to, to making coffee. And, like, with mixed success, like, I think the team there are doing a fantastic job. Hannah, especially, is, like, you know, really seen out that vision and made yeah. what, we, what we kind of all you know, surpassed what we hoped we could do with it. Um, but, I, you know, it, it's not necessarily been the most effective in a, a turnover uh, sense. And I think... That is like a, it's an interesting like observation. It's like uh, being the best and and buying the best coffee and trying to serve the best coffee hasn't necessarily resulted in the the highest amount of trade or you know and yeah. and I guess that's part of the argument is like our job is to try and like find a way that represents us the best we can, but in a profitable sense. It's yeah. like. We can't, because, um, you know, and every business, like I was chatting to other business owners at the UKBC, I won't name names, but I'm like, really ones that from here I aspire to be slash I'm really inspired by um, who've been in the game for a long time. And like, you know, it was quite reassuring to be able to chat to those people and get a similar picture that we're encountering, which is that businesses tough right now yeah. like, like it's not easy and so I don't think there's any shame in trying to be thinking about your business in a way that ensures profitability because like getting out of COVID was like first tick on the on the task sheet like if you managed to get your business through COVID like well done because yeah. it's not easy now we're in this cost of living crisis um, and as we know like staff wages have gone up probably th- 30 plus percent yeah. in the past year and a bit yeah. um, and will naturally continue to rise. Um, Cost of goods, like the coffee has gone up massively as well. Yeah. So we're like sitting down this morning trying to like go over our margins again for like a pastry and stuff. Yeah. You know, like really granular details that... But obviously all the pastry margins like for them have gone up. So 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And I think so everything's like, it is so tough. But I think that feeds back into quite interestingly people are not massively willing to pay more for a cup of coffee. Uh, yeah, and go figure. Yeah, it's very, very bizarre, isn't it? That, you know, we're talking about high-end coffees here, and obviously we've had the geisha that Kyle used in his UKBC available for sale at Melville and at Frederick Street. Mm-hmm. And it's 50p more expensive, I think, so for a flat white it would be £4. And we've sold a lot, but... Yeah. I, not many people are regularly paying four pounds for their their flat white, and we do get pushed a lot that we're too expensive. And I just think it's an interesting your whole spiel there. Costs have gone up way. Our costs have gone up way more than the price that the coffee has gone up. Definitely. So our margins are one hundred percent smaller. Yeah. Not by a hundred percent, but <laughs> definitely squeezed. They are a lot smaller than they were two years ago. Or yeah. Pre COVID, let's say. Which and like the knock on effect is that of that is us like not being able to probably achieve like everything we want to. Like we've got to start picking and choosing like projects and you know, like 
who we work with and how we work. And it's like, it's pretty frustrating. So this has gone off on a real tangent. Well, it has gone on a tangent. So I guess what I like, keep going on that is, uh, is it changing the face of the coffee industry then? This, uh, do you need to have more strings to your bow? Because we, we talk about this quite a lot, that um, the, the majority of customers are probably wanting a guilty pleasure type coffee. You know, Melville's a very high volume place. People are coming there for a coffee regardless. So is it wrong of you to be like, I need to probably just try and squeeze my margin on the that coffee, try and get the quality as high as possible, but try and get as much margin as I possibly can out of it? Yeah, and, I, and like I, this is where I see green buying and sourcing as a real art because, uh, you know, there are ways that you can decrease your cost of goods, yeah. your green coffee that you're sourcing um, in a way that doesn't impact, quality. impact the producers. Yeah. Like, for example, it's beneficial to them to have someone forward buy their coffee and know that they've got that security that they're going to get paid uh, fixed so they price. don't have to like offload at a commodity price so yeah. you know obviously we've never paid co- a commodity price for coffee and we can you just explain that briefly what that means it's quite an yeah, interesting like, concept well c- coffee is is basically um the, the value of it is um justified by a sea market which is the commodity market of coffee yeah so it's you know it fluctuates dependent on um, the uh, requirement and availability of stock, I guess, and like what's happening on the dollar and yeah. like all this kind of stuff. It's uh, a kind of constantly moving volatile um, uh, number that uh, the majority of world. pricing for everyone in the world is based for coffee on that, yeah. on the market. So Which is the same as oil. So it like bubbles up. Bubbles about like the yeah. price of oil, supply and demand effect at US dollar yeah. affects it, all that kind of stuff. Like a drought in Brazil will increase the commodity price yeah. of coffee. Yeah. And that commodity price is basically that's your bog standard. You know, Starbucks will be paying in and Nescafe around. Probably. Nescafe yeah. is it's probably like, a better example. Um, and yeah, then everything sure. else is a price on top of the commodity price, basically. Yes. Yeah. So if like coffee was a commodity, which many consider it to be, it's like. Yeah to buy coffee <laughs> yeah. would be like that price. But what we're doing is buying like, you know, a natural geisha from La Camina Farm that's yeah. part of the Red Association, Association's project of the yeah. Villa Maria washing station and the coffee's grown by uh, Alex Arango. It's like that level of detail then yeah. um, is where we're at. So, so it's not just coffee. It's Nescafe don't know who... Who was growing their coffee? Well, it, <laughs> no, it'll joking. be from like of course they multiple cooperatives that just gets piled in all the dregs of yeah. of what's not so. Like, oh look, we found this pile of coffee from six years ago. Yeah. Let's chuck it in our nest cafe. Do you know what? I like. I've been pulled up on this before for like being too, like. I don't know the picture of what Nescafe yeah. is doing, and it's not fair for me to say that. because again we had this conversation this morning. It's like. Starbucks, and this factors into what we're saying, it's like Starbucks are an incredibly um, uh, skilled like organization. It's yeah. like they will have people on their uh, team who are way more skilled than me, have been doing this for decades longer than I have. Yeah. And if they wanted to launch a UKBC or source a UKBC coffee, would do a much better job than I can. Um, and this is where, like, what they are trying to do is they have a laser focus. They know, like, who their customer is. Yeah. They know what they're trying to achieve. And off the back of that, they they um, source accordingly. And I think yeah. that's kind of my argument is, like, the fact that we are not buying all the time the the best coffee on the, on the offer lists or sourcing it um, – from the kind of best farms in the world isn't a reflection of like our skill set or that we don't know good coffee or that we don't you know um we don't want to serve that it's more a case of like we want to try and work out the coffees which taste fantastic with but we can market and be profitable so it's like we want to ensure that the coffees we're buying um have a wide enough appeal that we can open it up to, uh, to enough of a demographic that are interested in what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and it's almost like a more challenging but 
for me quite more enjoyable process to try and find a way to like yeah to sell those coffees or to market those coffees and i think it's been a challenge to do that with the fluctuating green pricing recently where yeah. you know our green coffees which gen- generally are considered to be like chocolatey and nutty maybe um and kind of more like your classic sunday french press kind of coffee yeah like brazilians like guatemalans um we had one recently that was like 14 pounds 50 a, a bag or a box um and really I don't think that market, that price reflects the market for that coffee. And that's where, like, it's challenging for us to think, okay, uh, in a, a small sense, like, how do we how do we get a coffee that, uh, how can we source a coffee that we can market to that, or um, to that demographic, I guess, the, that consumer base. Yeah. And just going out and being like, right, let's buy a geisha, it's not going to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I, really I do think it's it's interesting. So again, you look at your origins and your caravan type businesses, which you know they'll be turning over tens of millions of pounds, I assume. And yeah, none of them are built purely on a specialty, high end specialty coffee basis, are they? So I think you know, we we chat about this again off air as part of it. You've got to think right. Well, what is the business model I want, and what is the business route I want to go down, mm-hmm. and. You know, I think if you want to sell and serve high-end coffees, your margins will probably be lower, which means you can scale at a slower speed unless you get investment. We also talked about, obviously, paying staff, um, your own staff. You know, if your coffee price is higher, it eats into your flexibility to pay your staff Mm -hmm. better, all that kind of stuff. Like, I think you can can then push, like, make your your unit price higher and get a similar margin but you're sacrificing volume and i think like that's yeah. the problem it's like there isn't a big enough audience f- to to get that volume higher at the moment no and i was finding yeah as in there's not a volume of people rushing out to spend four pounds on a flat white basically which we yeah. you predicted which yeah. is coming and it is coming hopefully it will come so, in uh, a few years yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good one actually. It's yeah, in like, case you didn't know, I said in a press release at the end of last year, flat whites would be four quid, and I'm sure they probably are somewhere, but uh, we didn't. Reach well, we that. sell Fr- uh, registry oh. the geisha four quid. There you go. But I, I guess like our coffee should be four quid. Like a flat white should be four quid. We include the cost of oat milk in that, but yeah. Um, but we don't have the balls to do it or we 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 can't then competitively have an edge so. no so when you uh, obviously said this is what we were going to discuss this week i had a quick just think in my head yesterday around uh how does the cost of a cup of coffee at Cairngorm stack up um so you know what are the different elements of it and i think prepared because that's not <laughs> I, well in in my head very high level i was like the cost of the beans is low is probably one of the lower numbers. So let's say the cost of beans, I think, doing my maths, it was roughly 20p, potentially. For a cup of Guilty Pleasures, the bean cost is 20p. Mm-hmm. The milk cost would be at least another 20p on top of that, depending on whether it's oat or regular milk. The staff cost is then, I think my maths was like a pound, and then your rent and utilities and all that other stuff was, I can't even, am I making up numbers now, but <laughs> potentially another pound. Yeah. Um, or potentially 50p. So, and that's where it all goes, basically. Yeah. So if you add all those numbers up, so it, that, it's like £2.50 to £3 per cup is, is the cost. Is that 20p on coffee based on what we can produce it for? like, Or is it based on what... A wholesale customer of ours would be. Uh, I think I based on a wholesale customer. Um, obviously, if you are roasting your own, you can kind of get those yeah. costs down. But it just shows that. But then like, even yeah, it shows you even it's an even lower price than that. Which it is. Good. But I think that for me is the important part that um, the biggest costs are actually the staff and the utilities and the mm-hmm. rent of the cafe. Really, that yeah. is the by far the biggest costs that go into a cup of coffee so yes you could obviously serve uh geisha and that geisha may cost though um you know if it's four times the price instead of it being 20p per cup it becomes 80p per cup 
mm-hmm. which is you know an insane amount really isn't it for the coffee yeah. but again that's a long well, well, long quite interesting about that as well is that so you like if the milk cost is t- say 20p i think we you know most cafes the model would be to charge like an extra 30p for a flat white as opposed to like a black coffee or something. Yeah. You're basically just char- charging what the, the cost of the goods are. Yeah, yeah. But then there's obviously like a lot more labor and having to steam the milk, the skill set. Wastage the picture, of milk. Wastage. There's like so much involved in it. And that's where I think like yeah, running a cafe is extremely hard. I think a lot harder than anybody realizes. Like yeah. Every food and beverage business is would consider to be very hard to imagine well that's i think that was where i was getting to with all that is that obviously so if your staff cost is a pound rent and everything's a pound and the coffee and the milk's another pound it's like yeah so if you sell your coffee for three pounds fifty you make 50p per Mm -hmm. coffee theoretically that then doesn't include the all back office or your accountants or your marketing or any of that kind of stuff as well so it's like again there's all this uh, i think coffee at the moment getting a slightly bad rep to a certain extent probably we're creating that bad rep by talking about (laughs) prices going up but you can see how quickly it adds up and how you know obviously our costs like we said have gone up so much over the last two years and it's been really really difficult to try and pass that on so obviously we've taken the hit even stuff like so a a cup and a lid then is basically more Ah. more expensive than a coffee yes like the coffee cost but if you factor in somewhere like bonnie and wild as an example where we're seeing an enormous amount of breakages like i've just had to buy 20 more teapots it's like as soon as there's a a, a cup that breaks you've got to sell like 10 more coffees to buy a new one absolutely mind blowing (laughs) mechanics just don't stop i mean they've got some sort of teapot breaking machine it's a crisis (laughs) it is actual teapot crisis yeah. maybe there's, no they're all breaking crisis they're of 2023 it is do yeah. we go back to steel anyway he's motioning he would like us to move on Have to a crisp break, a crisp break yeah. but it's not really crisp then i think we could talk about something else we discussed pre um pre hitting the record button um which is other markets that 43 um we'll have a quick this these are open so they might not look great on camera why are they open since i got hungry in the car <laughs> uh, uh but I don't know if you've ever had. It's called Cro- Crosta and Molica. I have had the these brand. Before. You had the their bread. They do like a kind of yellowy looking, like sourdoughish bread. I don't know if I have. Was that breadsticks? Yeah, they yeah. do. I, but the I, bread I, is honestly great. It's like quite it? thinly cut, but like really white. Mm. Uh, it's it's banging. It does sound anyway, these uh, are, anyway, these you've are, already eaten half of this. So. De- depart- it's a departure from crisps because I was like, well, they're crispy. I was like, it's quite interesting. To, we had a pizza last week or the week before. Um, quite, yeah, very crunchy, I would say. A bit herby. Very stale. Do they too stale? No, I opened them last year. <laughs> <laughs> no. I love them. I think they're good. Oh. You can imagine that with a bit of. Um, Hummus or something. Hummus. Yeah, hummus. I, I, I say hummus, but I always think that other people say hummus. So I sometimes say hot. Hummus, just to gauge the room. Yeah, this is and doing then, weird things to a voice. And then when everyone's like... Yeah. yeah. Then I'm like, oh, no, 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 me neither, I me mean, neither. Hummus. <laughs> hummus. Um, classic hummus. I love that. Um, have you seen... It's another meme. But it's basically... I don't, oh, fuck. Completely fuck this. It's a joke. You'll have to tell me the meme. And they, like, they, 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 it's just a picture of a hummus with like Tesco's branding on it. It's just classic hummus. It's a classic hummus <laughs> joke. That's quite like, oh, classic hummus. You know, Jack not enjoying that joke. Well, maybe I did that. Out. Too, too bo- dad joke over here. <laughs> um, these are really, really good. I think really good snack if yeah. you are not wanting any health benefits at all. I would imagine they're not very good for you, but... Well, a lot of oil. Jack is intermittent fasting at the moment, so he's literally watching us dro- drooling. Oregano-infused oil. I can taste that. Yeah. Can we score these in the same way that we score crisps in terms of creeds? I think the the rule has to be, what do you think... Ross Creed would score it. And I would say 
a solid eight. And I think even more with a wee bit of summon summon on top of it. I'm maybe doing Ross Creed a dirty here. <laughs> but is he as cultured? Whoa. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. You, I'm you're saying yes. Back him. I'm saying he maybe wouldn't. Well, to be fair, it's what creeds am I giving it? Not what Ross. I don't know what Ross would give them. I don't think he would like these as much. Yeah, I think a, I'm going to give them an eight. You gave them an eight and a half. So about an 8.25. There, you heard it here yeah, at first, did. people. They are very, very good. There's also, I think, a tomato version of these. There is, yeah. I don't know if they're vegan. Um, these are definitely vegan. Checked for you. <laughs> Checked for you. Um, really good. Right. Back. Do we? This is when we we go on tangents sometimes. There is there anything you want to talk about now? No. no. During a crisp break, or, or, or just like anything, anything that's on your mind. Or? No, yeah. but I, I was enjoying where we were going. I think we did jump around a lot, so let's maybe recap. What, what's well, the so point of this podcast again? The, the conversation we had off air about CCTV, off air, <laughs> <laughs> off air about the CCTV cameras and the the model that a lot of like tech-based cloud, especially um, utilizing software or physical products would um, aim for that subs- subscription model, Yeah, which is like uh, similar to like printers and ink. It's like uh, sell Very the, good. The, the product cheap, but then there's a follow-up investment needed on a regular basis. Yeah, And I, I think like what we were saying is that the guys who invented the Canon printer, uh, in that example, uh, <laughs> ain't you full out what they're doing, but but could have made a much more efficient, probably, um, version of it that adds more value to someone's life, yeah. but isn't as profitable slash sustainable as a, as a business in that sense. Mm. Like, they want that regular ink payment. 100%. Um, and I think that's where we're, we're going. Like, not, again, not to try and tarnish like the picture of like our business but i guess there has to be like one foot in a a business setting and one foot in a kind of like excitement of how great coffee is yeah i think uh that is that we you know we could serve in much more extravagant and more exciting coffees but we almost choose not to because we don't think it adds enough value to our marketplace and i agree with that and at the risk of sounding like a whiny business <laughs> owner i think quite often people profit can be a dirty word uh people think that everyone who runs a business is printing money yeah. all the time um and i just think there's a particularly in scotland I, and potentially the uk versus the u.s I think business owners can get a slightly harder time when it comes to making money is almost a bit dirty in the UK. Um, Whereas, you know, it's no coincidence probably that a lot of these ridiculous subscription models that you get originate in the US where everyone's like, yeah, steal my (laughs) money. As long as you're running a business, it's great. More specifically then, do you think Scotland is even worse for that than England or the rest of the UK? I don't really know. I think in Scotland... We are hypersensitive to value to yeah. a certain extent. So try and, you know, Bonnie and Wild is a very good example of that. Like a lot of our negative reviews that we potentially get at Bonnie and Wild are around pricing, essentially. Mm-hmm. Like, how can you charge three pounds for a croissant? And it's like, I can tell you exactly how. Yeah. And this is how it happens. And it's not because we're pulling your pants down. No. It's because we're trying to make a tiny little bit of profit Um which means it needs to be sold at three pounds. And it's very interesting that we have quite strict formulas around all of that kind of stuff. It's like, this is the margin we need to make. So this is the profit, uh, the price that it needs to be sold at. And I think we've had a lot of interesting conversations around, like I've worked across lots of different businesses. At the end of the day, they all make net profit. So the bottom line figure, Mm -hmm. if you're, you know, you want to be aiming for 10 to 20%. And, you know, you could run 10 different businesses. You're still aiming to make 10%, let's say. So if you sell a million pounds of stuff, you want to make 100 grand net profit. Yeah. And <laughs> which is, that's not necessarily the, the case. Uh, no, 100%. <laughs> and I, I think that's so easy to say and so hard to do. 
Yeah. So I just think there's a bit of a disconnect between probably employees and people who get paid, say, a salary of £50,000 a year, mm -hmm. and then the effort that is needed to generate £50,000 of profit. So you need to sell £500,000 worth of product to potentially generate a £50,000 equivalent. Mm -hmm. I just think there is a slight lack of understanding around you the amount of stuff you have to do to sell a, a fucking coffee is like absolutely ridiculous um so yeah 100 percent. and i'm not saying you know 50 grand a year is a very very good salary in the uk and scotland so there's not you know millions of people sitting there on 50 grand a year um but there's a lot of businesses small businesses in the uk will make you know 200 grand a year and you've got yeah. You know the business owners scraping, working extraordinarily hard to try and make their twenty k. And we've talked quite a lot about the mechanics of like owner operator businesses, yeah. where actually that, in a cafe sense, that's probably the most like feasible way of operating. It's yeah, like, the the scale up is is very challenging. It will be the most common way of operating. So I think the majority of cafes in the UK will be owner operators, mm -hmm. and from a lifestyle, it's definitely a lifestyle business. I think you would be the first to say it is a tough, tough lifestyle to be doing. And, oh, there's just so much shit going on at the moment as well. You can understand yeah. why a lot, and you do see it happening at the moment, a lot of people are being like, no, nah. fuck this. <laughs> but, oh, I, like, there's there has to be a tipping point, and, and uh, we've not reached that tipping point ourselves. But, like, uh, listening to Caravan talking on a podcast uh, this morning, and like, uh, yeah, it's all about trying to surround yourself with, with people better than you are to try and allow them to take on. But to get to that point, you need to be turning over X. But yeah. I think there is a point where, you know, um, I think it's really hard to look back. So like, if you talk about making a hundred thousand pounds, like f for me, opening a cafe, that seemed like quite a big task. Yeah. But now it's like, you know, our our goals will be to make a hundred thousand pounds on selling wholesale coffee. Now, you know, it's like, you know, the, the the evolution is quite like it is there, but it's hard to consciously look back and see that. Yeah, um, but I think interestingly, there when you made a hundred thousand pounds, you probably still make ten to twenty percent net profit. Yeah, and then when you make a million pounds, you still make ten to twenty percent. Yeah, net profit. Obviously, that increases the amount of profit you make. But you, I remember you telling me that. Uh, I think it was a Spencer Matthews podcast with Jamie DeLang. Well, I can never remember his name. Lang, yeah. But basically saying getting to your first million, million yeah. is ridiculously hard. Mm -hmm. Getting to 10 million is impossible, basically yeah. is what he says. Yeah. And I think that is such a good summary of running a yeah. business. Like, I, I think then the idea is that once you hit that, then it's like... Well, it, it just there's other people who come in on board to Un willing to invest yeah there's actual your business is generating enough profit you, probably to reinvest you, as well you can afford to pay people who like have the skill sets required to then basically take it off your hands like in, employing a ceo for example would be like that would be game changing eventually when well, you, you might that. sack you though <laughs> 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 like, no, no i had a coffee you have to pay me out <laughs> um but like, that, yeah. that, like you know that that, that's an interesting conversation in itself because if you brought in a CEO to your business who wanted to sack you, then that is quite telling, isn't it? It's like you're yeah. not actually you're aiding the, the business in any sense. And I think at that point, it's like, well, fair play. You're I, not adding value to all the people that are giving up their lives to help you run the business. I, I, it's interesting. It's such you an have interesting have responsibility, point. don't you? You, you do. And this is where we're, it comes back to, and again, we've gone on such a good tangent here, I think. But overall, when you set up a business, it's important to run the business you the way you want to run your business and mm -hmm. have it very clear in your head what are the aims and goals. And those can change, I would say, every year or two years, maybe you reassess your goals. But if your goal was to make 100 grand and then you hit it, you reassess and you're like, okay, yeah. the goal is now to make a million. And then if you hit a million, maybe then you start to think, okay, well, what next? I don't think, personally, I can get this business to 10 million, so do I need to sell it to someone, or do I do something else? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, as business owners and 
cafe operators and generally the coffee industry, it's important to understand what is the end goal. And that yeah. can change. You know, you have kids as well. Like, I think there's a lot of life moments which definitely change mm -hmm. potentially your aspect on life in general and how you should and want to run your business. For sure. You could sell Cairn Gorm tomorrow, probably. Yeah, I think about it quite a lot. <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But then the question is, what would you do, I guess? Yeah. So I, I think it comes back to this whole, is selling speciality high-end a business model? You know, if we come all the way full circle, because we're almost at an hour, if we come <laughs> all the way full circle on that, I would think it is a model, but you really have to double down on it and make a business and you target 100 grand. And then if you hit 100 grand, you're like, mm -hmm. right, can I hit a million? Selling yeah. purely high-end specialty coffee. I have no idea if the market is there for that or not. But The most obvious example to me at the moment of like a business that have gone full throttle in a coffee sense, a specialty coffee sense, would be Grind. Who Pods Grind. Yeah, but that's like an aspect of what they do. So they yeah. started off with like a couple of cafes and then they started a roastery. And then right before COVID, they pivoted that to be quite... Um, Podsy. Yeah, and it was like just perfect timing i only know them because of pods so that's interesting. yeah so then they became pods but now they've just uh, bought out like a cold brew canned cold brew company and See, they're now launching that and i feel like you know that is how you scale a coffee business but there's not a there was there's a not a slither of that which is like high 80s 90s specialty coffee i don't think like you know and that's that's fairly telling i would say you know that's the market probably doesn't they don't need to cover that market to get to that stage. I think that's probably the interesting ist, the most interesting point then, mm -hmm. is effectively what we're saying is you want to run a business, you want to scale a business, and you want to make money, you horrible person. So to do that, you need to cater for a wider bandwidth of mm -hmm. customer. And yeah. in your view, the only real way you can do that is by offering reasonably priced coffee and then buying reasonably priced green coffee to fulfill that basically yeah and i would caveat that as like currently that's where i see it because yeah. obviously like that standard of coffee wouldn't have existed in the marketplace 10 15 years ago yeah. like it's constantly evolving so i guess the, it's one of those ones where you know you look at starbucks as an example opening X number of reserves around the world where they're mm. like, this is going to be our higher end like specialty thing. So I think there's like, it's one of those things that needs to be constantly reviewed. I know for us, certainly the moment where we deem our most, the most value to our business is, is in trying to sell good, great coffee to the most people we can and try and allow to them to absorb people. our business. To great people. That's great coffee good. to great people. <laughs> that is quite good. Hey, get that on the wall. Bye, great people. Yeah, bye. Great, <laughs> <laughs> great oh, times. Oh, great. Who else? Someone really famous has used the word great as well. Uh, I do like the, the slogan, just like great times. Yeah. Great coffee, great times, great people. There we go. Uh, again, on a t-shirt. If you <laughs> Put on a t-shirt. Um, oh, that was honestly quite exhausting, having that conversation. It was. It was a real, real deep dive. Uh, zigzag. And I don't know if we really achieved anything from our our goal of chatting about what we were chatting about. We can clip but, up some sound bites probably. I think there there hopefully is some value in that for someone. Yeah. Certainly got my brain ticking, so um I think it's a great interesting point. And what I will raise with that as well is um it's an opportunity to open that up. We really want to get Paul from Lowdown on the podcast. Yes. And I think it'd be a super interesting conversation in more detail probably around you know, that whole aspect with him. Yeah. Interesting. And I suppose to caveat that, we're not saying that the upper echelons of specialty coffee is the wrong approach. Uh, I think what we're saying is... Pick whatever business is right for you. You've got to be consciously saying. making a decision on what, like, you're trying to achieve and Definitely. you're trying to market. And I think then it gives you cl more clarity, I suppose, on how to market that. Yeah. that's There's nothing worse than being a, like a real clouded version of yourself and not understanding what you're trying to do. So, um. And I, I would say just on that as well, as a business owner and generally as a person, back yourself and, you know, go 
go with your gut and do do what you think is right until it is proved categorically that it's wrong. So I'm like, if you think you have a good idea, it yeah. probably is a good idea and go with it until someone's like, or enough people are like, that's a fucking terrible idea. But yeah. For sure. There must be so many, so many ideas out there which have never seen the light of day that are great. Definitely. Equally, if the likes of Steve Jobs hadn't got Apple off the ground, the, the world would be in a different place. It's like, there's so many little things that add catalysts to completely change the world. And right. not necessarily saying coffee can do that, but pretty sure a lot of those people will have been drinking a cup of joe in the morning. Am I right? All right. Um, I think we can end that there, but I'm like, there's a bit, there's more to come after. So I was just going to leave. Oh, no. um, let's, so thank you very much for listening. And then if you enjoyed it even more, stick around for this next book chat.